question is, um, how does inclusion fit into this? And it's, and, it's, and it's such an important question that I think um, people have been struggling to kind of answer because it's such a new space. And today we are joined by some of the leading experts in, um, in this space. And that's what makes this so exciting because we have um, Patrick Ford Hutchinson uh, joining us um, from Northumberland uh, Country Council. He's a coordinator and has years of experience. Um, we have Louise Dawson, um, who actually um, my co-founder and, uh, and partner and Mariah Partners um, has actually worked with before. I just learned that. She's the head of inclusion and specialist assessor um, for the BSME Inclusion Network. Um, and Claire, thank you so much for joining us from the lovely group of uh, schools that is Aldar. Um, and really excited to know um, about your experience too, because it's really in that kind of uh, public-private partnership space within um, within the UAE's context. And um, uh, of course, the lovely uh, managing partner of Mariah Partners, and of course, my co-founder, Christine nasser um, We did this again, yes, we, we are running these weekly webinars and we're running them because we want to make sure that we can get um, the, the kind of the amazing expertise that exists in our community and bring it to you um, so that we can all support each other in this journey for uh, better outcomes for our children and uh, teachers. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Christine take over. And, um, and yes, really excited to have you all here. Thank you, Nyla. I'm also really excited about this too, because I think you know, you'd probably agree that outside of literacy, special education needs is not our area of expertise. And so we really um, rely on the expertise of people around us. And schools around the region, and when I say the region, I'm talking about the, the Middle East, um, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa are really in various stages of welcoming um, students back into in-person learning. And their experiences really do vary. So some students have had almost a year of online learning at this stage. Um, some continue to be learning primarily online. Um, and then others have had more of a hybrid experience, perhaps being in and being out at school. And I know our, our, our panelists all have students at various stages of, of re-entering. At the same time, while, while schools, uh, many of the schools that we work with rose to the challenge of distance learning um, really rapidly, um, digitizing the learning experience, um, supporting students with special education needs has been a little bit of a black box. Um, it's, it's, it's a unique challenge. And in September, a McKinsey report really highlighted the importance of trying to bring students with special education needs back into schools, into in-person learning and prioritizing them as much as possible. Um, so I, I wanna know what has that looked like in your context? What have you been able to do to bring students um, back in? How have you been able to prioritize the most vulnerable students in your community? And I'm gonna start up with, with Patrick. Um, I, I wrote country on the slide, I apologize. That's Northumberland County in the UK. Um, but Patrick, I'd love to hear, you're, you now have a mandatory return to in-person learning. So you have a government that, that's saying, we need to get students back into to school. But throughout this experience, how have you been able to prioritize the inclusion of special education needs students? Well, what, what we found in uh, Northumberland is that the lockdowns have affected the youngest learners and those of the most complex needs uh, throughout the whole process. This is also, this is our actual third lockdown that we've, we've gone through where schools have been closed and, and we found this through the last two as well. And what we found, it was very important to get the younger learners, those of the most complex needs, which meant that we're struggling to communicate, regulate, and get them back into uh, education as quickly as possible. So special educational needs in the UK, it, it, was, it was never closed totally uh, compared to our mainstream uh, counterparts. What, what we had, we, we had to make the decision as leaders in schools to what children we wanted to get back into school. And this was either down to their need, their age, or if they had... Uh, outside agency involvement where, where we felt they, they were at risk. But what we found for all learners coming back now is that 
we need to reestablish those routines. What our learners need is that they need to be in a consistent setting to, to learn and they have to have reliability and desirability in the, in the education setting they're in. So this is really at, at this time in school now where we're looking at the second week of having all children back in. We're really looking to reestablish those routines, reestablish the consistency, reestablish the relationships with staff to make the environment reliable and desirable for all our children so they can make the most progress. What we found during this is that the quality of assessment needs to be, needs to be at, at, at the top. We need to have taken snapshots of children throughout this period, whether it be before COVID, after a lockdown, or what we've had over in the UK as well, we've had bubble closures, where if there's been a case in a, in a bubble in a school where a, a year group, a, a class, the whole class would go off for, for 10 days or two weeks. So we, we need to be taking snapshots all the time to see where the children are and then to see if there's been any regression or if there's going to be any lack of progress going forward. And what this, what this allows us to do is, is where we are in the process now in the school I'm working is that we're, we're looking to put in high quality academic or therapeutic intervention in place and thinking about our, our approaches in the classroom to the cohorts we teach to ensure that, that we are meeting their needs and we are getting them to at least back to the, their pre-COVID levels and hopefully they can kick on from there. But as, as, as uh, I, know, I know a lot of us will know is that with children with special educational needs, it's, it is a big, big struggle to get them into those routines and it's it's not it's it's not just a, a flick on flick off with these children and it's it's a, a long process of making sure making sure that we have got everything in place for them i want to pick up on something that you said that's yeah. really interesting in the the uae context it's this idea of reliability and desirability because Families in our context currently have the choice to, to uh, have their students at home or, or to send their children to, to, to school. And for a variety of reasons, including uh, multi-generational households, which are very common here, um, many communities have been quite hesitant to, to send their, their children back. Um, and so Claire, as, as uh, you know, you, you oversee inclusion across a really diverse um, group mm -hmm. of schools including the charter schools, private schools, and the ad hoc schools. When, when you've been um, really ha prioritizing the, the needs of, of uh, special education needs students upon their return, how, how have you been encouraging schools to really create that reliability and desirability that brings students back in? It, it definitely has, a, has been a challenge and quite different whichever group of schools you look at. So for our group of private schools, really generally people couldn't wait to get their children back, back in. You know, there, there are a, a, a cohort which we're still working on, on encouraging back um, through some personal relationship, really getting the relationship of, of trust with the parents and, and making sure they feel safe and know that their children are safe. So there's been a lot of parental work that's been done prior to getting the higher, higher needs students back in in the private settings. But in ADNOC and the charter schools, which have mainly an Emirati cohort, there has been a very, very little take up of coming back to face-to-face -face learning, not just for students of determination, but really just, just general students. It's, it's a very small percentage of students that are choosing to come back, which is very frustrating because the ones that are coming back are just making accelerated progress. They're just ready to learn. Our students in Abu Dhabi have been out for a year. You know, we've, we've been closed for a year. So it's a very long time for those children not to have access, um, just general education, social socializing, um, friendship groups. So much has been lost and missed and it's really multiplied for those students of determination you know it's that they have have regressed they uh, some of them cannot access anything online you know they can't access anything independently so they've had to have an adult with them so any assessment or, the, or that's been administered we don't know if it's how much assistance they've had so you know baselines are really not accurate so we don't even know really where to to pick up with them when they do come in so that it's a sense of urgency that we have to get them back in where we work very hard with individual risk assessments with families and with the children themselves and you know 
and trying to, to encourage. Them. But with the multi-generational households, it is a huge concern for some families. And, and you know, and it's a valid concern. So, you know, we, we can push and persuade as much as we can, but at the end of the day, if the family doesn't feel comfortable, then we have to respect that and just try and provide the quality that we, we you know, we, we are doing and can do, but it, it's a frustration for sure. I think that point about relationships is one that, that has come up time and time again across all topics of, of uh, education over this past year. Um, Louise, I'd love to hear, how have you been able to prioritize inclusion during this year where you're, you're, you're at Jumeirah College, which has been you know, open uh, primarily aside from you know, everyone's had to close here and there for, for different reasons. Um, but how have you prioritized inclusion there? And, and what have you seen across the, the inclusion network at BSME as well in terms of strategies to prioritize inclusion? Yeah, so I think um, when we first went into lockdown on in March the 5th, way back when, we basically brought our Easter holiday early and we had two weeks to get online. And again, being pri with primarily private schools, being able to have access to technology and the internet and having students who were used to that technology, a lot of our children were able to continue accessing education. And I actually think across Dubai, many schools did a really good job of keeping children engaged, keeping children online and um, keeping them on task. Um, and I think also because parents are paying that private fee, which is what Claire said, they have much more invested um, interest in having their children online. I think our highest need children were the, the biggest challenge for us, especially those children that couldn't access the technology and um, did need that adult with them. Um, we put in, a lot of schools here put into place a, a very, we, did, we put in a, a very tiered structure of support. So each child had a named buddy. So if they went off the radar or if they needed extra support, that buddy was on, on that case. So um, in secondary, for example, each of my LSAs had 10 children and each day they had to make contact with those 10 children and the 10 family parents and caregivers to say, do you need anything extra? How is it going? Are you okay? And so having that, being able to, we have, to have those staff and to be able to disseminate that structure was, was key in making sure that we didn't lose children. We, we have, we have got children that we, we know have returned to their home country. So when we went into lockdown, we have children that returned to China, children that returned to South America who are offline and we do not know what where they are. And we know that, that and we're, we're doing our very best to get in contact and we're, we're having communication with parents, but sometimes there, there's maybe one or two children that we, you know, per school who we don't know where they are. Um, so safeguarding and, and all of that kicks in massively. And, so I am a practitioner head of inclusion at a secondary school, Jumeirah College, and then in my second role, I'm the BSME network lead across 144 schools across the Middle East. Um, so yes, yeah, same as Claire and Patrick, some of our children are home by choice due to medical needs or, or family structure. Um, to return them into school, we, we did a lot of phased reintegration, so those that were fearful of coming into school, as Claire said, like um, with, with the family concerns about getting sick, we were bringing them in for an hour a day rather than bringing them in for the six hours straight off. So we had that phase, gradual re reintroduction into school. We've seen a massive increase in well-being support need. Um, it's social and emotional need has skyrocketed. And I think that we're at the stage now where yes, academics are important. Yes, we're still teaching. Yes, we're still delivering the curriculum. Yes, we're still doing assessments. But actually, if a child isn't in the right place to do that, then that child is supported individually with their social, emotional, mental health needs, um, especially at our children with medical needs who are not in school as well. But yes, definitely increasing concern for those off the radar, increased concern for the well-being across across the whole network. Um, and that tends to be the topic of most of the webinars that are going on at the moment is the well-being. Because we know, we know that if we get that physiological need in place first, we know the rest of it will come. But the fear is, is still there. I think we've seen an increase since parents are being vaccinated. We've seen a, a, quite a, a change since we've had that coming in, which is all, all good news for the future. But uh, yeah, one-to-one -one support, buddying, relationships, like Claire said. Um, yeah, all, all the same. We're doing the same things, just trying hard to keep our heads above water. 
But what strikes me about the examples you shared is that there's a real structure to it. You know, the idea that every LSA is assigned, and I, we're using UAE lingo here, by the way, and I know we have people from, from other countries, yeah. but yeah, learning, learning support assistance, but having somebody, whether it's a teaching assistant or an administrator in the school who has a responsibility for a certain number of students and that there's a regular call schedule, I think that certainly decreases the likelihood that you'll have a student fall through yes. the cracks. Yeah. Yep, Fascinating. I, I mean, think um, within the mainstream that, that um, role was picked up by heads of year, by tutors. I mean, I don't think any of this has been one person or one department or one area of school. I think what's come out of this is a massive amount of teamwork and shared responsibility rather than individual it's not my as the head of inclusion it's not just my job otherwise I think we would probably have all cracked under the pressure but that that the ability to share that across the, the network across the schools and you know head teachers supporting each other heads of year supporting each other senkos supporting each other I think that's been a real nice thing that's come out of this because there's lots of good things that have come out too absolutely absolutely and so so one thing um that that's really clear is that we are wherever you are, um, there's a pretty good possibility that there'll be some con uh, continuation of hybrid learning into the next academic year. Uh, there's an organization out of the US called One Schoolhouse that, that uh, does a lot of work in this, this online and hybrid learning space. And they delivered a survey to a large number of American in the US independent schools. And over 60% of the schools indicated that they expected to have some form of, of hybrid learning. So knowing that um, possibility of having hybrid learning is, is sort of here to stay, or at least here to stay for the foreseeable future, Claire, in your experience and across the diversity of schools that you support, what are some of the most effective inclusion moves or, or strategies for those students who are going to be online for the next few months or the next year? I mean, I, th I think, one of the very important things is that we have to remember is that they do deserve equal access. So even though they're choosing to stay at home, you know, obviously for any teacher, any subject teacher, class teacher, form teacher, it's very tempting to focus on the students who you've got in front of you. Because of course you've got, you know, you've got them there, you've got their responses, you've got all that lovely things that all the reasons we all became teachers in the first place. But to ensure that lessons are still appropriately differentiated for students who are not in school and that is not easy I you know I say that not flippantly um, it's a huge challenge and has been a challenge for teachers to get effective differ differentiation via distance learning because you just don't have the response that you have from the students who are there in your class you know but I think you know that really needs to be a focus and a priority I know from from myself and my colleague who who work in HQ here doing that training and in small chunks, letting them try it, seeing if it works, working out the impact. So still that ongoing staff training, which you know is hard. It's a hard balance to achieve when staff have had to learn so much so quickly and are out of their comfort zone most of the time. You know, we're very, very aware not to keep putting too many new expectations on them. But for the sake of the children, if you're just delivering things <laughs> that they can't do, the gap is just going to get bigger and bigger. So that's a huge push for us. Um, something else that works really well and that when we've done our quality assurance drop-ins have been the use of breakout rooms. So the breakout room can be then entered obviously by the children who are distance learning, but then they can be joined by their peers in the class. So different peers can kind of be on the camera with different breakout rooms. And that's been a really nice way to get in school students working with their peers who are still at home and just maintaining those relationships, getting some collaboration going, making them feel part of the class and part of learning. So that's been a, a pretty effective thing that we've actually seen in, in practice. Um, encouraging the cameras on and we've had such a challenge with this you know it's so 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 simple and it, you'd think it was easy it's the hardest thing <laughs> for these children to put their cameras on you know we you know you lose so much if you don't have a facial cue from them you have got no idea how 
how they're doing if you can't see their faces. And our Emirati students are the least reluctant to switch their cameras on. You know, they're so, you know, for, for cultural reasons, some of them are just swinging the lead. They just don't want to. Um, but, you know, as much as possible, getting the relationship where they feel comfortable enough to have their camera on with you. I think that's, um, yeah, we haven't solved the problem. We've just made it a priority. We're still not, we haven't really got an answer um, for that. Um, and we've also, um, as, as the other colleagues have spoken about, targeted intervention. So making sure that gaps are picked up for these students who are both in school and distance and still trying to fill them um, wherever possible. So our schools have got a range of size of support teams. Some of them have got small support teams. Some of them have got really, really well-resourced, uh, human, human resourced support teams. Um, but pulling in SLT to, to do those interventions, if there's a lot of students in the class that haven't picked it up, rerunning the lesson. You know, I mean, the, the good thing about hybrid and having lessons recorded is that students can go back, you know, so really encouraging that way of working. And I, I do hope that that's something we keep, you know, we hold on to when we, when we are one day or back. But, you know, have those lessons as a bank of revision or, a, you know, a basis for, for intervention. So it doesn't have to be a teacher running it. It can be a, an LSA or it can be an inclusion assistant or a, a CA who actually just reruns the, the class and, and is there to, to pick up misconceptions. So we've had children who've done phenomenally well online, you know, without a doubt, our students on the autistic spectrum have really thoroughly enjoyed not having any social stress. You know, they've enjoyed only having to look at their computer and not really talk to anyone and academically probably doing great. You know, on the flip side, we've had children who just haven't really probably learned anything for a year. You know, and it's, it's finding ways to reach those, I think, that, and I'm really sorry, I don't really have an answer to that, but the formative assessment that you do at the start of every session must be a sort of a sustained and regular practice so you know you know that there is just you're not going to keep the attention of a child who's learning via distance and doesn't know what's going on you know so wherever you can and and good use of of your support staff if you're lucky enough to have them which not everybody is you know and I know that but really utilizing them and in the breakout rooms is, is a way to address so but even when you talk about the, the support staff, I think, you know, one, one takeaway is just to think about it as, as people within the community, because I know we do have some uh, guests on the call or, or attendees who may not be in environments where there are support staff, but you, no. know, you really look at the, the, the range of who can be brought in to support lessons, especially if something's pre-recorded or to check in on, on a student through that phone call. And, and using experts, using your students as experts, you know, so, um, both online and in school, you know, so if you can find a student who, who's learned it and, you know, we know the best way to embed something is to teach it to someone else. So, you know, use of, of those students as well is, you know, we encourage our teachers to use anything you can to overlearn, overteach, um, because that's what, you know, those students are, are, are missing really. But yeah, I think uh, they would be my key highlights, I think, of things that have worked well. Um, we've struggled, you know, you know, I would love to say IEPs, but we've struggled to make them meaningful, really, via distance. You know, it would, it would have been a, a case of, of rewriting the, the rule book on IEPs um, to make them meaningful for the students who are still via distance. You know, so that's, again, that's an ongoing thing for us to try and make those impactful. And, and that may be we an do, I do, I do, We do have to acknowledge <laughs> this is a temporary thing. This is not yeah. going to be forever. I think we have to acknowledge that there are many children in the world who have missed lots of education for lots of different reasons, whether that's medical, you know, over generations. It's not just now. You, you can have a child struggling with a medical condition that's been in hospital for years 
and and then reintegrated into school and we always we've heard stories on LinkedIn and across the media of you know uh, refugees who've not spoken English who've not been in education who turn up in the UK in, at the age of 12 and are put into the system and they learn English there was an article on the newspaper on the news last night I think uh, about a refugee who entered the system at the age of 13 no English and he's just been accepted onto a doctor course a medical course at university and has had amazing achievement so I think there is a different story for children of determination children with special needs because we don't want them to lag behind but also we can I don't like catch up we can help these children to still be successful even if they have missed a year of education and we know that as educationists we know we have spiral curriculum in in, in a lot of the systems we know that we can go back and over teach and over learn and, and that there is space and time to do that and we do have to give ourselves a little bit of a break. We didn't ask for this. This isn't our making. Um, we, and, and we have to just keep supporting each other to do the very best by each individual child. And we will get them there. Education is a, a marathon, not a sprint. And losing a few months to me, as long as the children are well and healthy and alive and happy and having some form of connection, we will get them there because that's what we do because that's we've always done that. That's nothing new. <laughs> I that's, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think that's uh, very much what, what we see in the UK as well. As a, there's a lot of sensationalism uh, in the media, uh, definitely about how how we're going to have a lost generation of children and and uh, there there's, there's going to be this is going to be a problem for the years to come. Children are resilient. Uh, they they are they are probably some of the most resilient people in society, and, and especially the children that we work with who in their special educational needs that have to come over so much to get to where they are these children have already proved that they're resilient and they will continue to prove that they're resilient Look, my own husband is, uh, yeah, hates, oh, sorry yeah. my own husband who hates when i talk about him on webinars um <laughs> he he's somebody who grew up in a revolution and a war and, and you know throughout both of those did miss a substantial amount of school and and yet there's a lot of learning that, that you get from observing conflict. So I think it is important. Um, and I'm quoting Asha Alexander, the principal of kindergarten starters in saying this, we have to acknowledge what the children have learned even when they've been out of school at the same time. But I wanted to talk uh, to you, Pat, with you, Patrick, for a minute about the, the data that you're, you're getting in because you do have you know, most, if not all of your students back at this, this stage. You talked a little bit about the impact of, of the, the hybrid learning model and trying to get the students at least up to where they were at this time last year. But how, how will the data that you're collecting inform instruction for the next year? How are you looking at instruction differently now than you might have been a year ago? The, the main data that we've, we've collected so far uh, this year is that we've got around 25% of children that have shown some regression. Uh, so those are the children that we really need to focus on and really think um, about their curriculum and, and going forward from this point into next year. We'll see the main impact of this whole year, this, this whole COVID period at the end of the year when we really scrutinize the, the achievements pupils have made and any standardized uh, testing that goes on. So in the UK, this has changed quite mass heavily or massively. Uh, where we will not have your formal examinations that, that you would normally have. Uh, what we're going to have, we're going to have uh, teacher assessed uh, assessments, which will have to be heavily moderated and quality assured to make sure that they're accurate. But, uh, but uh, this is when we'll find out which children uh, aren't, aren't at the level we, we would hope them to be. And this is where we'll find out the, the, real, the real impact of, of the last year. What... What I would say is that the, the most difficult thing is to engage some of those families that, that's been mentioned. And, and these are the children at the minute in school where we really need to look at which families have not been totally engaged in the, the remote hybrid learning and what, what we can do for them. Those, those are the children that, that, that we need to look in school and think they, they may be the children that, that have, have, have missed some of the learning that, that could have gone on and, and really look at what we've got in place. And this is where children, I know baseline was just mentioned before, this is where children will have to start re-baselining children to see 
between now now and the summer of, of where children are and make sure that we've got a quality baseline where where we've made sure that we we have quality assured that and this is and this is be through the the normal quality assurance procedures that we would see in a school where where we where we complete some moderation which we've, we've been doing over the last couple of weeks we would do some deep dives book scrutinies uh, observation and but the main thing i would i would say that we need at the minute is really to empower teachers to what they're what they're seeing in their classroom seeing across school and have those have those discussions with each other and really open open the doors for, for staff to, to discuss and to share ideas and and to really think creatively how they how they can try new things to to really to really help these children because the the next thing that we we will need to look at which is in the UK, which is going to be difficult until I'd say September, is that external quality assurance, because I know in a group of schools that I work in, we, we use very similar assessment systems, we use very, uh, we follow very similar curriculum, we, we follow the same advice from central government, so that external moderation of uh, relying on each other's expertise and, and relying on each other to to look at things in a slightly different way and, and through a different lens is what gets what gets the the best for the children. And once and once we're able to do this, this is where schools can really think of and and modify their curriculum going forward to to how we how we respond to this COVID. And what what we have currently is that we that we have the media and and government ministers coming out saying that schools will be open longer. Uh, holidays will change. Um, more, more uh, learning supports uh, assistance will be, will be brought in, and these and these may be all great ideas, and they may all work. But you have to have the plan and the strategic thinking behind that in every school or in every area of school to go forward to to make sure this has an impact. And this is this is where the direction really needs to be thought about. In in my opinion, the direction really needs to be thought about in in, in British schools from this point to uh, July, and then in September, you're really running on the curriculum that you've gone through. You've quality issued the assessment. You've had those professional discussions. You can really think about what is going to be responsive to the pupils in front of you, and you may not have the breadth that you previously had because you may feel like. It's not appropriate for, for children to to be to, to have the to have all the areas of the curriculum. You may really feel that social communication is something that really needs to become a focus. And I know it does in with the pupils that I work with, that remote learning and speaking to each other on screens, on telephones can only can only uh, develop communication so so much. But that face-to-face -face communication, uh, children, especially with autism, getting a feel of, of, of how people react to them or, or the expressions people make, because obviously they find it very difficult to read these things, is, is we need to get them, be giving them those experiences. And it, it's all about the experiences and how we plan our curriculum to give the children the experiences that they need. Thank you so much for those insights, Patrick. We really appreciate that. I, I'm going to um, actually move a question kind of up on my list since we're talking about assessment. Luis, um, even for those, those folks who are, are not at British curriculum schools, I think we understand that assessment is, is changing. What, are the, what, what do you see as the, the impact of the, the shift in the approach to assessment among uh, British curriculum schools. And if you could just explain what that is a little bit for, for non-UK school folks. Um, and then, uh, you know, what do you see as the, the impact to changes in assessment um, on uh, students of determination or students with special education needs? Sure. So within the UK system at the age of 16, they take a series of um, GCSEs, which are provided to us by the UK government and we um, administer those under test examination conditions. Um, and for students of determination, students with special need, um, they have the exam access arrangements in accordance with the exam board in the UK JCQ. And then we go through another two year program of A-levels and AS and A-levels. And then we sit another set um, at the age of 18 of JCQ exam board regulated assessments. And so this year, um, as similar to last year, a little bit different, but similar to last year, the teachers are awarding the grades for the children instead of taking the formal sit down assessments. So we know that there's pros and cons of 
formal assessment and that you will sit an English exam from 10 o'clock until 11 o'clock on Tuesday and you will be measured against all the other children sitting the same exam. So the pros of that are in the preparation, there's lots of time for children to have self-analysis, lots of time for them to do past papers, lots of time to the, for them to revise. We know that exams are a tool for life because it is something that we generally, you know, depending on your profession, we have to go through assessment throughout our life and we do need to get used to that process. Um, we do know that if you are successful, then that can increase confidence and, and self-esteem in you um, as you go through the process. Um, it also teaches children to self-regulate their anxiety um, so that they, uh, because again, anxiety is something we're all faced with when we have heavy workloads, when we're told to go into lockdown, we, we all have that. Oh my goodness, I've got 400 hours work to do and I've got two hours to do it. So being able to self-regulate and manage that is an important life skill. So, um, and obviously then the results are all standardized and this can help us to detect flaws in teaching. So not necessarily, so the process come leading up to the exams when we do mocks and when we do practice assessments, we can identify where we might have misconceptions across a group of children. So it's not that the teachers are doing a, a bad job, but that we know that um, sometimes we're not, um, delivering what the children need in order to make that assessment meaningful. So there's lots and lots of pros to having an exam system. The, the cons um, are that when we are doing teacher assess grade, we need to make sure that all the teachers are trained and have the same level of ethos and ethic and moral behind what they're rewarding. So that may that standardization and moderation may take place very thoroughly and rigorously across one department, but are we doing that across different departments and different subjects so that we are having that equity across? Um, we also need to, um, so we, we then lose that ability to manage children's anxiety. So um, we put into place, what we've done is we've put into place lots of mocks. We've put into place lots of real time, real assessment um, processes through the year since September. Um, lots of, um, but again, our students that are at home, like Claire said, when you have students at home, you have no idea really if their work is theirs or if they have a tutor sitting beside them or if they have Google under the desk. A lot of that we don't always know. So we, we use something called ExamsNet so that we can put the paper up and the children can only access that screen. If they come off the screen, the exam shuts down. So there's, there is some technology behind what we're doing um, to ensure that we have that rigor across our assessment. I think the biggest thing for me about teacher assessed grades is having been doing this for 20 years and working with children with autism and ADHD and probably a little bit myself too, I don't perform at my best and I know many of my students don't perform at my, their best until they are under the pressure of, you have an hour, demonstrate. So I, I worked with a child with autism who made a lot of sense to me because he said, I'm not explaining in my mock paper what photosynthesis is because I know the teacher knows what photosynthesis is. I don't need to explain it to the teacher. Um, so I, I used to have a, an alien puppet in my classrooms um, where I'd say, OK, you're not explaining it to me. You're explaining it to this man in outer space who doesn't know what water is, who doesn't know what sunlight is. So explain it to the alien. Don't explain it to me. Um, and, I, and I know from history, from year on year on year, my ADHD kids and my autistic kids do far better in real assessment than they do in mocks because that isn't. They, they know it's not the pressure, they know it's a practice. And I think having that history of mocks through their life, they know it doesn't mean anything, but they know the GCSE does mean something. So they all perform better. And I don't think that that is a widely known fact amongst typical teaching staff who are moderating these exams to be able to implement that. So if they're a, a CB borderline student, they would get that B in a real exam. If they're a BA student, they would get that A in the exam. And it's having that confidence. I don't think teachers have the confidence to know. And I don't think we've done any analytical you know, data moderation about the reality that this does happen. I have anecdotal, I can tell you year on year, my children with SEND always perform better than they were predicted to perform. And I don't think that that's widely accepted and acknowledged. So that, that's, that for me is the con of having those assessments. I had no idea, I'll say that. Right. 
absolutely. Okay. And, and, I don't know, you know I might be I... wrong because that's just my experience and what I talk to with my friends. I don't know, Claire, Patrick, do you see the same kind of trend with your students? Um, uh, I would I would say, especially in maths, I, I teach uh, a lot of maths. Uh, and, and what I what I definitely see in maths is that children children do exceed yeah, yeah, expectations, uh, especially in that, that black and white. And it's, as you say, with a lot of children with autism, uh, their their rationale for working that hard and the lesson won't be there, it's especially especially if there's a subtle change, whether it be the weather, whether 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 it be uh, elsewhere in the learning environment, they they're not going to perform consistently every lesson every lesson. But if right. if they if they have if they have the idea at this this exam is going to be it's going to be the thing that really really measures them they they they'll work, work with that yeah yeah it certainly strikes me that you know a great deal of thought and and training will need to go into this and claire earlier you were talking a bit about about training in these small chunks um, and part of that is because this has been a completely new space for for everyone of course like online learning is not yeah. new but, but being a brick and mortar school and shifting into online and certainly simultaneously teaching online and, and in-person students, this is, this is new, right? Um, and so there have been a lot of unknowns. Now we're starting to, to get a better sense as to what's working, what's not working. But I'm really curious about school improvement planning for next year. And so as you're working with the school uh, leaders, with the principals across your network, what guidance are you giving them with regard to inclusion and school improvement planning? I mean, absolutely. You know, and it has, it's been everybody's priority about, you know, what, what next year is going to look like. All of our school principals, whether they are charter, ad hoc or academies principals, have been instructed to create a kind of close the gap curriculum. So as part of their, their school development plan, they've got this addendum, which is completely focused on closing the gap. Now that gap is not just the academic gap, as, as Louise was saying, you know, it's it, we need to know how they're coming in and what they're coming in with um, a lot of ranges of anxiety, you know, that some students are running in, can't wait to be back, others are pensive, others are very, very worried that they are behind. Some are worried that they've got no friends anymore. You know, our, our cohort has changed. So many people lost their jobs. They're going back to classes, which they, you know, that are unrecognizable to some of the students. You know, many of our, our private schools had pilots families in them. Well, those pilots have now gone, you know, so in a year their, their friendship groups have changed. You know, some teachers are, are not there anymore. So. To, to really be mindful at all points of the, the level of anxiety and the emotional health of one, their children, two, their staff who have had a year that really, if teachers have survived this year, they are just, you know, they're certainly my heroes. And also the anxiety of parents, you know, that we've got a, you know, a, a triangle of, of um, stakeholders in our schools who um, and they all deserve equal care you know obviously students are our priorities but if their families are not okay then they are not okay if their teachers are not okay then they're not going to be able to put things in place that can close gaps and accelerate learning and make rapid progress or even make their children feel safe so if our teachers don't feel safe and secure how are they going to make their students feel safe and secure so this kind of closing the gap addendum to it, the school development plan has been really, and each principal's done it in their own way. They haven't been told how to, you know, how to write it, but it's been really interesting to see, you know, the ideas and, and, and things that, that people have come. One school has taken away the, the traditional reporting statements, for example. So, you know, the anxiety that parents have that and children themselves have and teachers have for performance management and KPIs and those things, that stress has been taken away. So they're not coming in as A's, B's, C's anymore. They're not going to be reported as um, those really, really strict and stringent guys. They're going to be emerging or they're going to be developing or they're going to be embedding. So it's a much more gentle language that one school has chosen to use. You know, they're, they're offering 
credit catch up sessions, you know, so that it's delivered to the students in a way where it's it's your chance to kind of make up this and, it, and then it's a, a bank of credits that you can have, especially for our American curriculum schools, which lend itself much better. That doesn't work quite as well as in a GCSE cohort, but you know, different things like that. They've, they've, they've been really innovative in their way to make children feel happy, safe and secure. And we've tried to think of everything a child could be worried about and <laughs> get that in, but um, there's always something, isn't there, that, that's, that's not there. But that really has been the basis. I think, yeah, of course, we don't want them to, to academically fall behind. But as Louise said, you know, they'll make it up. They really will make it up. You know, in our SEM students, they're used to being behind and they're used to feeling behind and they're used to having to catch up. This isn't a new feeling for them. This is their normal. So, you know, in a way, as long as the gap hasn't increased so much, they might have actually been given a little bit of slack, some of them, you know, but, um, and I think focusing also on the things that have, have worked well, which, you know, many things have worked really well this year and not letting go of those, making sure there is the option for, for using the, the platforms and the hybrid learning. I mean, PTCs are so much easier now you can do them via, Zoom, um, via Teams. You know, it, it's really <laughs> streamlined that situation. You know, so, so things like that, that we can hold on to, um, I think um, schools will do that. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. What are we holding on to, right? What's been really effective? Patrick, can you give me um, some examples? What what aspects of hybrid learning or the online learning experience for students of determination or special education needs students do you want to see remain? What's worked? And and would love concrete examples of what you want to see kept in. I think I think the the thing that we would really like to see remain, uh, in, especially in the school I'm working in at the minute, is a focus on the things that matter. That seems to be have, have come up in in engaging parents in that. The what I'm basically talking about in, in in our establishment is that every child has an educational healthcare plan, which a set of targets are, are put on for where we want a, a, ch a child to cut, uh, get to at the end of uh, a couple of years. So we have that for cognition and learning, communication, interaction, social, emotional, mental health, and sensory and physical. So a child will have four targets. What we then do is then break those targets down into a, what you call a, an ILP, I would, would have thought. Uh, we, we call them PLIMS, personal learning uh, intention maps. We, we make those into smart targets. So it's really just working on, on four or five targets with a parent that we want. I think what, what we can do at times is overall uh, families and parents and, and, put, and put too much onto them, especially those, those families that we've struggled to engage. So if we really break it down and make the learning uh, really uh, important to the pupil and important to what what the families uh, want want to see their ch their children move forward with, and also make it engaging. So setting up fun activities, I think where we've seen the most success is where activities have been fun for the parent as well as the child, and, and there's been that relationship building between parent and child, and about the parent really seeing the the progress that a child's making and the things that will really matter to them going forward, whether it be their independence, whether it be their social communication, whether it be their emotional regulation, really looking at these things and, and giving, giving families a little bit of a, a free reign as well, where, where we say, this is the target, these are the activities that I think would work really well. However, if, you've, if you want to try something else, take some photos, take some videos, uh, send them back to us, show us, show us, show us, show us how it's going and, uh, and we'll keep monitoring that and, it, it, and to make it fun as possible for, for parents and children. I think also what, what, what teachers have had to do is learn how to use other, other mediums for students to show what they can do. And I think that's a real positive. So now every teacher is an expert in the whole suite of Microsoft inclusive facilities. You know, so if a child wants to make a mind map, they can. If they want to use the post-it board, they can. If they want to submit a video, that's been all right. So hopefully that kind of thing has been more normalized and that's got to be a good thing. You know, yeah. that the different means of, of students being able to show what they know and what they've learned. I think that that's a positive and I hope yeah. we can hold on to that. 
really and, interesting. And you mentioned too. two others as well, which were um, video content that's available to children to watch yeah. and watch and watch as much as they want. And mm. the other thing was the, the parents' evening, being able to access people. I mean, I, I love now that I can, I don't have to flip between this office and that office and this office to have meetings with parents. And, and also one thing that's really increased for me is if I needed to have an IEP meeting or an, a, a PLIM meeting or a parent meeting, I would usually just get one parent, either mum or dad, because one would yeah. be working or looking after the other children. But now we're doing it through Medium. I can have dad in the office and mum at home or mum in the office and dad you know, in a restaurant and being able to do that. I mean, I had a Zoom meeting with a mum yesterday who was in the back of a taxi. So, you know, being able, that flexibility to meet people when I need to, in different areas is, is phenomenal. We've done different countries, you know, dad's been in China and mum's been in, you know, Austria. It's, it's been, I think that is really gonna help us to have that, that, that triangulation of parent, all parents, not just one parent, that's um, been huge. So with all of this, I mean, I think the, the, the points that have been raised around teacher well-being are, are so critical. Um, and I, I think one thing that's been really amazing this way is or this year have been the networks that have um, emerged formally or informally, as well as networks that have had to shift and, and go online. And, and please, as you said, you oversee a network of 140 schools. Is that yeah, right? 144, yeah. 144 <laughs> schools. What? What are you planning to do in the upcoming year to support teachers with their inclusion efforts? And how yeah. is that different now from what it might have looked like a year ago? So, so BSME have um, really taken to the online platform because those 144 schools are across the Middle East, meetings and conferences and network get togethers were always in person and were very difficult and, and expensive and time consuming. So um, what they did originally and um, right at the beginning of this is they created a bunch of networks by topic. So I'm, I manage the inclusion um, network, but we have EAL network leads, we have English network leads, we have maths network leads. I mean, there's, there's a massive list of all the different networks that, that are happening. And those networks are performing in three different ways. So we have um, every two months we have a webinar on that specific topic with speakers so we have the webinars like everybody else um, we have um, uh, uh, chat forums now on the on the BSME website if you have an inclusion question you can go onto the chat forum and we can re respond to that so you've got your networks being built your bi-monthly webinars and your chat forums for BSME which has been phenomenal within the uh, within I was going to say UAE, but actually we have people from Africa and Singapore and we, um, we, we started a, this was born of a group of friends, my friend Catherine and Susie and myself, we, I think we were about two weeks into lockdown in March and just sitting here feeling I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough for my children. I'm not doing enough for my friends. I'm, how on earth do I help teachers? What do I do? So we just went, Anybody want to join us for a chat and a coffee? And uh, we all came on Zoom and it, it born the Wellbeing Inclusion Network across, um, which is separate to the BSME. So it's a, it's a more informal. BSME is formal and the Wellbeing Inclusion Network is very informal. Anybody can join. We have a different topic every two weeks um, and we alternate send with well-being and it has been teacher well-being at the forefront of, of nearly 50 percent of our webinars have been what can we do how can we you know we can't buy flowers but we could give people half an hour off can we cover people's lessons can we create a video for and share it amongst our teams how can we help teacher well-being and that that's been massive we've got 500 senkos on that group who come in regularly and talk and i can see a couple of names here for people who join us so that's fortnightly. That's really, really um, come off. In terms of priorities for us for next year or for the for the, tomorrow for the next is to continue embedding. We have a Dubai inclusive education um, um, policy, um, so it's to continue embedding that, which has as kind of in some areas have had, has had to stall because we're not in school. Embedding that practice, continuing the training. So. We talk about the students having those videos so that they can pre-learn and overlearn. We've created a whole um, bank of videos that people can come and watch for, you know, what, does it, what is a good IEP? 
and how does that fit into your context? Because you every context has a different format. Um, what are your strategies for differentiation? How do we upskill each other? And the biggest thing from all of the networks is we're all okay. We are all doing brilliantly and we need to give ourselves a break and a pat on the back because you know this wouldn't have happened in the 1801 pandemic this wouldn't have happened in the 1701 pandemic this is phenomenal what we're doing and you know uh, just that everyone's just coping and we need to give ourselves a break with that because we we have done it. every single teacher i know every senko i know every leader every anybody that's involved in education the outpouring when we went into lockdown the amount of technology that was provided to us for free and I know that some of that was a lost leader. And I know that some of that was intended to up their own profit. But the intention to provide us with technology that we could use and with no obligation to buy. It wasn't, we'll give you three months for free and you have to buy the contract. It was completely free. And that's education. And actually, the world has really, really come together in a lot of good ways, um, which is what we want to take forward, right? That's inclusion. Everyone belonging. That's inclusion. That's amazing. I think, um, you know, one of the schools that we work with actually in Lagos, Nigeria, they, they did a survey for their students on what practices are working, what practices weren't working. And one of the teachers or school leaders was telling me that in the survey, one of the students said, you're being too hard on yourself. You're doing everything you can. And I think it's, it's really beautiful that the students, the students actually see probably more than parents how different the teacher's role is, how many more responsibilities have, have been placed on them. So I'm gonna ask you each for, for one last thing as we wrap up, um, and it's actually more for, for the teachers and educators who joined us this afternoon. What's one of your top um, self-care tips as, as we you know, navigate this, this complex and uncertain time? I'll just whoever wants to start us off. Turn off your computer regularly really regularly make sure that you have time designated i'm i'm rubbish at it i don't turn off i'm here five o'clock still going at it i've got another meeting straight after i am absolutely rubbish at the self-care thing because i get my satisfaction from helping everybody else i think like a lot of people in inclusion we we have to make sure everyone else is okay and we don't worry about ourselves but um if if i have anything for anyone make sure you turn off your screen regularly for good self-care time that's 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 television screen phone screen laptop screen ipad screen all technology needs to don't leave us everyone's leaving now yeah, I, know. <laughs> I was like not yet not yet we've got one more minute <laughs> hang on still of our webinar turn off the technology at some point tonight <laughs> yeah 501 it's all good <laughs> how, how about, how about i i would say enjoy your weekends really you know weekends are for the kids even though they've been at home we haven't been really with them if we're parents you know my weekends now are a hundred percent for my children no work at the weekend that's different right <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's it's a little bit a little bit of both there where i would very much say don't have your emails on personal devices when it's if it's if it's a personal device oh, don't, wow. have your, don't have your email on there uh that causes me so much anxiety. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah, no yeah. idea. But, <laughs> but what 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 generally happens is that you 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 check it. You end up checking the email just last thing before you go to bed or something like that, and it's it uh, can and then interrupt your your sleep. But also, yes. I think that 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 timing thing is very important as well. Is is if if you decide and at the start of the day you're going to be leaving work at five o'clock, make sure you leave work at five o'clock and make some time for yourself that if you want to go out for a walk, if you want to go and do some exercise, make time for that. I'm, I'm a father of three and uh, three children under six. And I know, I know sort of by the time I get home, then it's dinner time and then it's bedtime by seven o'clock. It's, it's really that time where it's like, right, I need some time for myself now to switch off and, 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 and charge up for the next day. Wonderful, wonderful self-care tips. Uh, for everyone who's here, I just want to let you know, we will be running another webinar this time next week. The focus of that webinar is on um, child protection and safeguarding in hybrid learning, um, which again is one of those sort of uh, complex topics. Um, we will be sending out information on that. The following week, it will actually be on Monday at a later time. 
um, and it's going to be on quality assurance. Um, so that's a, a super interesting topic, I know, for, for our team. Claire, Louise, Patrick, thank you so much for your generosity of spirit and for your time today. We're very, very grateful for uh, to all of you. Thank um, you. I, may I share your LinkedIn details with the participants? Great. Yes, awesome. please. Okay. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone, and go turn up thank your you. screens now. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Absolutely. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Bye. Nice Cheers. to meet you all. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.